Nice. Hey folks, I hope you're all having fun at home right now. I know that I'm bored out of my mind. This is sort of an informal devlog on a suspension modeling package that I want to create. You know, what better to do during quarantine than start a large, likely unfinishable project. So I want to start by showing you the program I currently use to do suspension design. This is called Optimum Kinematics. So you start by creating a model of the suspension you want to analyze by editing the layout and the pickup points in this window. And then we can define different motion profiles to simulate and then run a simulation. So I want to note here that the simulation actually happens in real time, so it's pretty quick. Once we've run our simulation, we can go through the results and plot things that we care about. This program is pretty useful, but as with anything, it has its quirks and its limitations. So I want to make a program like this in Python. We'll be able to model suspension kinematics, and hopefully we'll be able to incorporate this into a much larger LAPSIM project. The first thing we want to figure out is how to represent this gorgeous race car in some sort of format that's useful to us. We want to keep track of all of the different components, where they are, and what connects to what. Let's start by labeling every pickup point on the car and then putting their coordinates in a list. By putting everything in the same list, we can use matrix algebra to move stuff, which ends up being a lot faster, as there are libraries like NumPy that are already made to do this sort of thing pretty quickly. Next, we'll need to tell the computer how these points interact. We'll do this by grouping them into components. If two components share a point, that means that they're connected. So you can see here that our tire is connected to points A and F, and our upper A arm is connected to points A, B, and E. Now we can create another list which contains all of our components and put it beside our point list. I want to stress that each point that we're adding to each component is just a label. The actual position is only recorded once in the original list. And you'll see why I'm doing that a bit later on. All right, so now we have to figure out how to move all these points. To demonstrate this, I'll simplify things into 2D, but the same concepts will apply in 3D. Our goal is to be able to move this wheel up a given amount and find the new position of each of these points. This is complicated by the fact that these links obviously can't change lengths. So the points on top, for example, would have to move in a little bit. Now the obvious way to do this is to use some trigonometry or a transformation matrix, but there's two reasons I don't want to do that. One, uh, do you have any idea how long this would take me to type out? It's probably about as long as it took me to make this video, which is a long ass time. Two, and more importantly, my biggest gripe with Optimum K is that the suspension setup is limited to whatever the developers happened to draw out of the hat that morning. So I want to be able to define a bunch of components and connect them together in any configuration that I want. And there are definitely some drawbacks to doing it the way that I'm going to do it, but uh, I think they'll be worth it in the end. So let's figure out a way we can cheat. Well, the only thing we really care about is that none of the links change length. So before we move anything, let's record the length of all of the links and store it somewhere. So now we can move our wheel up, and right away we notice that this new length here, I'll call it B, is a lot shorter than we want, which I'll call A. We can fix this pretty easily just by grabbing this upper point, and we'll pull it along the line of B until we get both vectors to be the same length. Now our problem that this length here, C, is shorter than the original D. So let's do the same thing again. Grab the point and move it until our lengths are correct. And then we'll just repeat this procedure for all the other points. All right, so now that we have a plan for how to move everything, let's think a little bit more about implementation. Python is an object-oriented coding language, and we'll be taking advantage of that to make this implementation a bit more intuitive. The obvious thing to start with is an object for the suspension. So we'll create a class called suspension and then define how to initialize it. This object will contain a list of points and their labels, and we'll also have a list of all of the components that make up this suspension. It'll also contain the solver function and the functions to move the car around, as well as some ways to show each component of the suspension. We'll also make a class for each of the components. This has a list of all of its associated point names and a reference to the parent suspension. When we initialize each member object, we want to remember all of the lengths so that when we run our solver function, we have something to compare to. This function here 
calc this matrix returns the length of each link that makes up the component. So we can run this first before we do anything else. Before we get too far into the weeds here and I show you the solver I've made, I want to be able to visualize what the heck is going on with our car. This program is only usable if I can trust it, and if I forget a negative somewhere and a wheel decides to exit the solar system, I'd like to be able to see it instead of having to check through every point by looking through a giant spreadsheet like an ape. So after a little bit of research, I stumbled upon this graphics library called vPython. It's generally used to make funky little physics simulations like this and had a lot of has lots of the movement equations already built in. We won't be using any of those, but this should work to get us started. We want to be able to show the suspension points and links that connect those points. This library is actually pretty incredible because this is the sum total of code it takes to show that. We have three lines of code and it opens up a little window in the browser here. You can pan around, zoom in and out and see what you want to see. I eventually want to use something a bit more customizable in the future, uh, but you know, baby steps. So I'm drawing this A-arm sort of thing, just using a curve and a bunch of different points. If we go back to the documentation here, we can figure out how you can use these to draw all of our components. Starting with curve, it just draws a line between a list of coordinates. We initialize the curve by giving it a list of vectors, but having to delete and create a new curve every time would be pretty slow and could actually result in a memory leak if we're not too careful. We'd like to be able to just move these points around. This modify function could work, but then we'd have to keep track of what order the points go in and that just could get annoying. I'm just gonna use this clear and append function. So we'll basically delete the list of points in the curve and then give it a new list. I think this could be a decent compromise. The points object, operates in pretty much the same way, so we can just use the same method as before. Unfortunately, we need to create all these vPython vector objects, which is a bit annoying. I don't know why they couldn't have just designed this to use like a NumPy array or even a list of lists, but it is what it is. So let's take a look at how a component shows itself. It's theoretically possible that this function could be called more than once while the component is in the same place. If that happens, we obviously don't want to spend a bunch of time redrawing this component. We just want to skip on to the next one. So that's what this needs redraw flag it does. If the component was moved, then this flag would be set to true, and we'd go through this whole process of drawing the component. Otherwise, we'll just skip to the end. For now, we can ignore this if statement here. I uh, haven't implemented a scenario where a component would have any children, so it's skipped, but might be useful in the future. Next, we'll get a list of points that the curve will follow. This function actually makes sure that we have a connection between each point so that it's essentially a closed circle. So there's gonna be duplicates in this list. This gives a bunch of extra lines when a part is rendered and things like uprights kind of look like jungle gyms, but uh, we just want this to work. We don't need it to be printy or win any awards. Then the next thing we do is if this is the first time we've drawn the component, we need to actually initialize the curve object. If not, then we can just skip to the next part and use our clear and append functions to assign our new points. You'll notice I'll, I put these things in a dictionary here. Uh, this is because in the future, I might want to be able to add stuff like labels and other visual objects, and I think it just might make my life a bit easier to keep them all in the same place. You'll also notice that I'm not drawing any points here, just the curve. For the majority of things, I think this looks a bit better without them, and for objects that I want to draw points, I can overwrite this draw function. And then the last thing we need to do is just set our redraw flag to false so that the next time this gets called, if we haven't moved anything, it just skips to the end. Cool. So let's have a look at how to actually make a suspension from a list of points and show it. Ultimately, I'll store all of these in a spreadsheet because hard coding things is never a good idea, but uh, this works for testing. So I've got my list of coordinates here and the list of names. The first thing I do is to create my suspension object. This takes all the coordinates and their names and stores them as parameters. Next, I'll create all my components. Each one gets a name, the point names that are connected to it, and the suspension object is assigned as its parent. And now we can show this suspension. If we run this, we should get a basic representation of a corner assembly with the two A arms, this middle section being the upright, and the link off the side here maybe representing the connection to the ground. I'll mention a few details here. If you remember from before, I mentioned that the suspension object can take a list of children. I've made it so that when a component gets assigned to a parent suspension, it automatically adds itself to that 
parents list of children. Also note that I haven't actually used any equal signs when defining these components, but I have when creating the suspension. In Python, if you set a variable equal to an object, like I do here, it saves a reference to that object so you can access it later on. Since these components are added to the list of children inside the suspension object, I don't need to save a reference for myself. The suspension object will just handle everything for me. Now that we can see what the heck is going on, I think we have the basis to actually implement a solver and move stuff around. I'm kind of working backwards here. We would actually have to move the vehicle around before calling the solver, but I think it'll make sense. So let's pretend we've told the car to move the chassis up by a certain distance, say 10 millimeters. Since this change would move every component, we'll need to iterate over each component or child in this suspension and tell it to update itself. This is giving each point a little nudge in the correct direction like I described at the beginning of the video. Then we just want to check if everyone is happy. Happy in this case means that the error in length is less than some tolerance. If a child is happy, then great, we can move on. If it isn't, then we need to tell it to give the points a nudge in the direction that would make it happy. We keep cycling through each component until the number of happy components is equal to the total number of components, and then we're done. As an aside here, I'm sure that if you know anything about anything, you can probably guess that this is going to be incredibly slow. I'll talk a lot more about this in a future video and even implement a much faster method, but for now this brute force sort of method works. So let's run a test to make sure we're on the right track. So I wrote this function that lets us move a point by a given amount. So let's shift our anchor point by 0 0.25 in Z, and we'll show everything again to make sure it actually moved, and then call our solve function. And I'll just add some inputs between each show so that we can pause the program to see what's going on and then just press enter to continue. So let's run this and see what happens. So there's what we had previously. I'll pan around so we can see a bit better. And now when I press enter, we should see the point on the right here move a bit. And there it goes. Now we should see both A arms move as well. Now they did move, but something else happened as well. I'll replay this screen recording a bit so you can see if you can spot it. Our anchor point really isn't acting like an anchor point. It just seems to move as well as the other points. And this is because there's no distinction between our anchor point here and any of the other points. So when the components update, they kind of just find a happy middle point and everything moves to the center. But we want to keep our anchor point in the same place. So we need to figure out a way to make certain points off limits. And that's what this lock points function does. We can give it the names of all the points we don't want to move, and then we'll add the index of all those points into a list. Then, before moving a point, the update function checks that list to make sure that that point isn't locked. So let's lock all the points in this system, except the two floating points, and try again. Now, when we run our solver, we get what we expected. The two A arms just pivot around their axis to satisfy all the constraints, and our anchor point stays in the same place. And now it's just a matter of scaling this up to include a lot more than just a simple four bar linkage. My next video, I'll talk about how I plan on storing all the suspension information and then reading all that into Python so we can scale this up to a full vehicle. If you're still here, Thanks for sticking around until the end. I know this is pretty niche content, but it's the type of stuff that I like to see. And if it's what you want to see more of, let me know with all those buttons down below. I'd also like to say that I'm by no means an expert in any of this. I'm entirely self-taught in both programming and vehicle dynamics. So take everything you see here with a grain of salt. Thanks. Bye.